Good afternoon, good evening. I'm Jessica Rodriguez, Director of Product Introduction and Access at AVAC. And on behalf of myself and my co-chair, Taryn Barker from the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the satellite session, bringing the dual prevention pill to market, opportunities for HIV and pregnancy prevention and implications for future multipurpose prevention technologies. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us on behalf of our partners, AVAC, CHAI, Man Global Health, Population Council, and Beatrice, as well as our, our sponsors, SIF, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Women Cares Global. So today I'll be describing what the prevention pill is and why it can be a case study for future multipurpose technologies or MPTs. The dual prevention pill is a fixed dose combination that contains oral PrEP, genopavir and uh, FTC, and, combined, and a combined oral contraceptive, levonorgestrel and ethanol estradiol, that is being developed for commercial use by Beatrice. It is a co-formulated bilayer tablet with differentiated colors, dark pink for the first 21 days and light peach for the last seven days. These colors were selected based on extensive in-user research. The packaging will be a cold form blister in a foldable wallet pack with instructions for use printed on the back. Women will be able to tear off weekly sheets um, for ease of use. And branding will, be, uh, will reflect a women's lifestyle product uh, based on experience from oral prep and family planning. A bioequivalent study will be conducted, which is the typical pathway for approval for many generic drugs. And um, current regulatory timelines uh, from Beatrice suggest that the DPP could receive FDA approval um, in 2024. The DPP can be for women of all um, reproductive age, but um, initial, our initial strategy um, recommends and, and, um, and has indicated that women ages 20 to 40 will likely to be um, early adopters and especially those with previous oral contraceptive and oral PrEP uh, use, um, as well as women who have uh, not used contraception or oral PrEP. Women who are on long acting reversible contraceptives will not be encouraged. Um, so combining uh, the DPP offers, so the DPP offers a unique uh, opportunity to expand access to HIV prevention and contraception. Uh, by combining uh, the, the two previously approved products um, and you bypass the need for a large clinical trial and um, we will build on lessons um, from uh, and the existing infrastructure from oral prep and family planning. It also has the opportunity and potential to break down historical silos between uh, HIV and FP delivery channels um, spurred by the introduction of a tangible product. And using a combined product could lead to better health, uh, health outcomes for women. Uh, one, pill makes the, um, one pill makes the DP much more convenient um, and possibly motivates, could possibly motivate women to sustain uptake use. Um, A woman-controlled MPT also affords women agency to mediate use, which is much harder with uh, condoms, the only MPT currently available. And women can also mask it as a family planning product to placate those in their lives who may be more weary of prep use. So dual benefits may address challenges related to daily pill taking while distinguishing the DPP as a single indication method. Though pill burden and side effects have often been cited as barriers to both oral contraceptive and oral PrEP use individually, women and their partners may be more open to taking a pill that is an MPT. Various discrete choice experiments underscore that demand for an HIV prevention method increases when a multipurpose, when multipurpose protection is incorporated and included. For example, in the TRIO study, although injections were the, although multipurpose injections were the most preferred among women, if the injection only contained ARBs for HIV prevention, preference shifted to other MPT pills and rings. The CUBID study also recently presented at uh, R4P earlier this year, 
showed that the majority, the vast majority of couples um, indicated a preference for a dual uh, purpose product compared to a single indication. And the majority of couples selected uh, oral tablets as their preferred formulation. And while the DPP is likely to be introduced immediately after the depriving vaginal ring and capital rear long acting injectable, these products do not offer contraceptive benefits. And um, contraception um, and pregnancy prevention is more top of mind for most women, especially younger women. So as you can see on the MT MPT pipeline graph on the right, multipurpose rings, injectables, and implants are in much earlier phases of clinical development. So the DPP could be available sooner and therefore help pave the way for future MPTs, even if oral pills may not be consistently the most preferred method among users. Kenya, South Africa, and Zimbabwe have been prioritized for evidence generation and selected based on a, a number of factors, including need, demand, and enabling environment. Need is defined as a high HIV incidence and high unmet need for modern contraception and the overlap of both. Uh, demand, where there's um, moderate to high oral contraceptive use and enabling environment where there are strong PrEP policies and investments to scale up national PrEP programs. Key um, metrics for success for the DPP will be uh, clearly reduced HIV incidence and uh, rates of unplanned pregnancies, improved net cost effectiveness, and greater investment in um, This slide outlines the key uh, activities that we've identified from the pre-regulatory phase to early introduction uh, and scale up. These priorities have been informed by HIV and F family planning uh, lessons learned um, and past and ongoing planning for introduction. Early planning for the DPP has really been marked by broad stakeholder engagement, which spans both the HIV and sexual and reproductive health sectors. So in conclusion, um, future MPTs are likely to build on the health system adaptations, regulatory delivery and financing lessons generated from the DPP introduction, of course, assuming um, and contingent on regulatory approval. Investment in the DPP could signal to governments and policymakers that MT MPTs are a priority and could attract additional funders who might be particularly interested in HIV and SRH innovations. The DPP could also foster and potentially accelerate integration of HIV prevention and sexual and reproductive health services, which we know are, are preferred by, by many women. A user-controlled and formulated pill supports convenience, again, which might motivate increased knowledge, use, and adherence to the DPP, and also um, generate overall familiarity with the concept of MPTs and thereby um, inc increase acceptance um, for future products in the pipeline. So by combining contraception, contraception and PrEP, the DPP could address women's concurrent needs for both um, preventing unplanned pregnancies and preventing HIV. It can also help to mitigate um, many of the challenges uh, such as stigma and gender inequities that women may face when taking PrEP alone. Coordinated introduction efforts could bridge persistent silos in financing and health systems across HIV and family planning, would respond to users' uh, stated desires and galvanize providers who will be key for DPP provision. And as, as we've uh, said uh, throughout the presentation, it could potentially expedite introduction of um, other longer acting MPTs and in the pipeline. So using the DPP as a case study, this session will highlight practical considerations um, for now and for the future. Um, we'll ask and try to answer some uh, interesting questions, such as what are the most effective entry points and best practices for users and providers? Um, how do different financing streams for FP and HIV influence delivery opportunities? And what approaches can be used to estimate impact? So our presenters today um, will share their work as it relates to the overall MPT landscape. And we're very excited um, 
to have uh, the stellar presenters with us today. And um, I wanted to uh, introduce Natasha Salafajani Kayoma from Copper Rose Zambia, who will talk about what users want, um, potential entry points and barriers for women. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jessica. Mulishani um, Vonse. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Natasha for, and I'm from Lusaka, Zambia. I will be talking about what users want, potential entry points and barriers for women. So when we talk about DPP, uh, it's very important for us to just understand the overall context in terms of family planning and in terms of PrEP and why we need um, the dual prevention pill. So the world population at the moment is about 7.4 billion. And of that population, about 1.2 billion is in Africa. That's according to the World Bank. And the population has been growing at a rate of about 2.5% per year. And it's estimated that by 2030, the African population will reach 1.7 billion. Now, the fertility rate, on the other hand, is at an average of 4.8 children per woman, which is in the Eastern and African, um, Eastern and Southern African region. And the unmet need in this region is about 25%, representing 49 million women who are using traditional methods or no method at all, and yet want to avoid pregnancy. Now, the dual prevention pill is a multi-purpose prevention technology. We heard in the previous presentation that it is a combination of oral prep and an oral a combined oral contraceptive. The idea really is that DPP could increase the number of women that are protected by PrEP, as well as potentially increase the number of women that are using contraception. Because when we think about contraception, there are about 151 million women worldwide using COCs, as I will call them. And of those, about 5 million are coming from 15 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, which have a significantly high HIV rate. So with oral PrEP, we've had poor uptake and poor adherence among women to date, despite being highly effective. Some of the reasons that have been cited for this have been um, stigma, and uh, stigma because most of the most of the times women are, are afraid of being regarded as HIV positive or promiscuous because the drugs look the same, and. So the DPP has the potential to reduce the stigma that is associated with PrEP-only products. Another way to look at it is that women's motivation to prevent pregnancy may drive adherence to PrEP when combined because women will not only be consistent because they, they are trying to prevent HIV, but they'll be consistent because they understand the benefits of contraception and they're trying to avoid pregnancy as well. Now, when we are rolling out the DPP, um, these this is some of the word that has been coming both from end users, from women. And this is, the, this is some of the things I see in my work daily. And I will highlight some of the entry points that I think would be great for the DPP rollout, as well as some of the potential barriers. So when we are uh, introducing the DPP, it would be very important to prioritize end user education. End user education is important because like I mentioned earlier, stigma is still existent. And this stigma is not only around um, HIV, but even around family planning. So it would be important to educate end users because there will be a lot of myths that come with a new product. And this is not only um, for the DPP, but for all the MPTs that will be introduced. So it's important to educate the end users and not only the end users, but the healthcare providers as well, because healthcare provider engagement is key. Providers sometimes have their own inherent biases and that plays a role in influencing demand, uptake and effective use of new products. And in some parts of the world, people don't like new products. Also, sometimes women want to hear about whether a product worked from another woman. And so it would be important to sell it really well in the beginning so that then they can be able to share with other women. DPP also needs to be part of the contraceptive method mix. And the best way to do this is to work through channels where women are obtaining family planning. While most of the family planning is obtained from the healthcare facilities, there are other methods, there are other channels that have been created. There are community health worker programs, community-based distributors who distribute family planning to women's doorstep. And this is the level to which the DPP needs to go, not only from a healthcare facility, but all the way to people's doorsteps. And that brings 
losing the discussion around integration because integration then means that the family planning community is meeting up with the HIV community to ensure that some of these products are going all the way down to community-based distributor programs. And which brings me to my next point about in, including it in the messaging platforms and education platforms, as well as curriculums. Because what that will mean if we are going to use the channels that uh, the contraceptive um, um, the family planning methods are using or the family planning channels are using, it will mean it will have to go down all the way to curriculums for community health workers and curriculums for comprehensive sexuality education. And that way we'll be able to leverage effectively um, the rollout of the DPP with other HIV prevention and contraceptive methods. So there is need to introduce, while there may be differences in the timing in which some of these multi-purpose prevention technology will be coming in, as one of them gets through the door, it, it would be important to also bring in the DPP through the very same channels and uh, leverage the rollout of prevention of these programs um, that way. When it comes to barriers for women, uh, there are many barriers that I see potentially. Some of them are low demand. Um, so low demand could be thought of in terms of one, pill burden. Some Those bills, pills are huge. Um, and well, some people may say, call, may call them huge. Some people may think they're fine, but um, some women are a bit skeptical because the contraceptive pill itself is much smaller than the um, dual prevention pill. So that could be a potential risk for low demand. Another risk is preference for other methods that they're familiar with. Like I mentioned, mostly women take on products by hearsay or hearing it from another person, uh, but also they're reluctant to try out new things because they don't want um, the side effects that may come with it. So that could be a, a potential risk for low demand. And that's why there is need to uh, work very effectively on the education programming. There's also need for STI counseling and testing and treatment because while the pill might be preventing pregnancy and uh, um, 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 HIV, well, PrEP. The thing is that we saw even from, for example, the ECHO trial that even with the gold standard of um, social behavior change communication or patient education, we still saw many women uh, contracting STIs. So it's important for STI counseling to continue and uh, treatment services for STIs to continue alongside the marketing of some of these products. While it may sound obvious to say, obviously they will continue, sometimes when there's a new product, a lot of the energies of the providers, of the support staff is in rolling out the products because they're trying to meet those targets. And then they subsequently may neglect meeting other targets. And um, this does happen in, in many settings, especially in low resource settings. A barrier could be product failure. Product failure in the sense that with the two drugs or well, the two kinds of drugs, because I know there are multiple drugs, there is a risk of, there are complexities of combination. So there's a risk of how do you deal with things like a missed dose? Um, for COCs, it's very clear what needs to be done when a dose is missed, but are those the same methods that are used when a PrEP dose is missed? Can you take two pills on the next day? And those, um, um, are some of the risks. If a woman gets pregnant while on the pill, that is considered as, as product failure, even though that risk is already there. But those are some of the complexities that come with combination. And sometimes that might send a wrong idea uh, on the use of the product. It's important for us to think about alternative contraceptive regimens, even as we uh, market this product, because one size does not fit all. There are some women that are intolerant to um, that particular combination of COCs. There is need to invest more in research and in adopting other methods and other contraceptive regimens that could be combined with PrEP as well. And um, one thing we shouldn't forget also is that there are still existing problems with family planning and PrEP. For example, there are commodity stockouts. Um, so if there are stockouts on other drugs, what guarantee do we have that there won't be stockouts on DPP? And we all know that that would mean um, it would have more grave um, impact on um, HIV prevention um, targets. If I have to compare the discussion around DPP or to show what DPP would look like, I would say that uh, the dual prevention pill is a 
is something that could hit two beds with one stone. And that is unintended pregnancies and HIV prevention. I know the animal rights activists would be mad at me for saying this. So then we'll turn to the baby and say, it's like having your cake and eat it. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I'll be happy to take questions at the end, but that is really some of the things we have to think about when it comes to um, entry points and barriers for women on the dual prevention pill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natasha, for giving us a balanced perspective of the, the potential uh, barriers as well as some of the unique opportunities associated with the dual prevention pill. And uh, we will remember it's like taking eating your cake and, and um, making your cake and eating it too. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our next pair of speakers, Adlai Dadadzi um, from the University of Zimbabwe, uh, Clinical Trial Research Center and Sianda Tenza from Vits RHI, who will speak about healthcare provider and client perspectives, preliminary insights from uh, DPP acceptable, acceptability studies that are ongoing in uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Thank you. Uh, like, like what uh, the introducer has said, my name is uh, Adelaide Dandadzi. I'm a BF for social scientists and then with the Investor of Zimbabwe Clinical Trials Research Center. And I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Sianda, who is also from the VITS Reproductive Health and HIV Research Institute. We are going to present our preliminary insights uh, from our formative work on DPP acceptability studies across the two sites. So uh, we conducted in-depth interviews with healthcare providers who are providing uh, sexual and reproductive health services, and also counseling. And we also conducted uh, focus group discussions with women who are currently using uh, combined oral contraceptives in South Africa, and also those who do not. And uh, in Zimbabwe, we conducted uh, the focus group discussions with women who are currently using the COCs. So the study objectives aimed at understanding women's interest in using a DPP and also to assess product acceptability among providers and to explore their training needs and recommendations. And uh, finally, to inform the implementation plan for our clinical crossover studies. Like what the uh, previous uh, presenter has said, it is also worth noting that uh, for our study, we believe that uh, the DPP is ideally suited for women who are already using COCs and other short acting methods or those who have an unmet need. It is also important uh, to note that our uh, choice is very important. We know that uh, every woman needs and wants an HIV prevention method and the pregnancy prevention method at different uh, stages of their life. So it is very important that we give these women uh, as many options as possible so that they can choose the method that best suits their needs and circumstances. I'm also going to share two methodological challenges that we encountered as we conducted our research. The first challenge was to talk about a product that doesn't exist. In order to talk about this product and to enhance comprehension, we developed a simple flip chart, which is a combination of graphics and text that we used to present information first about the COCs and then about PrEP and then about the two together. Another challenge, of course, is the impact of COVID-19. The team had to resort to virtual development of protocols and study instruments and to conducting trainings. We also had to put in place uh, extensive COVID-19 risk mitigation plans in each country to ensure staff and participants are protected. So uh, on our study sites, uh, the South African uh, site is, situation, is situated uh, in, in urban Johannesburg, which is characterized by high population and a hype of activities. While uh, in Zimbabwe, the clinical research site is located uh, in Shtungwiza within the municipal clinic. Uh, it is also worth noting that uh, in South Africa, the HIV prevalence uh, rate among the 15 to 49 years age group is slightly higher as compared to Zimbabwe. Uh, and also uh, COC use in Zimbabwe is slightly higher uh, than in uh, South Africa. 
So uh, to date, we have conducted uh, 29 in interviews with different categories of healthcare providers, 17 from South Africa and 12 from uh, Zimbabwe. So on potential advantages uh, of the DPP, the healthcare providers felt that uh, the product would empower women in preventing HIV and pregnancy, given that the majority of women cannot negotiate for condom use. It was also highlighted that uh, the DPP use will result in the reduction of unplanned pregnancies and HIV infections, and also offer protection in cases of rape. They also pointed out that uh, use of the DPP will have a positive impact on family planning and prep use, given that uh, it will assist uh, women, especially the young girls, with uh, prevention of HIV and pregnancy, which is one of the challenges that they are currently experiencing. Also, uh, DPP will result in less clinic visits in that women will be uh, getting their family planning and prep services at a single visit, thereby contributing to a more convenient service for the current COC users. And also that uh, taking one uh, pill will also lessen the burden of taking two separate pills for HIV and pregnancy prevention, thereby enhancing adherence. Uh, potential challenges highlighted that are related to the product include the daily dosing regimen that can lead to inconsistent use as some women might forget to take their pill. The healthcare professionals were also uh, worried about an increase uh, in side effects which might affect willingness to use the product. They also highlighted that uh, some women might get to a point where they get uh, fed up with using uh, the pill, thereby affecting the product uptake and adherence. They also cited that a uh, fear of the unknown, especially in relation to future side effects, might affect uh, pill uptake and adherence. I will hand over to my colleague, Sianda. Thank you, Adlard. So my name is Sianda and I'll be providing the insights from the woman. And so to start off with, we had 10 focus group dis discussions conducted in South Africa, comprising of five groups of COC users and five groups of non-COC users. And from our Zimbabwean sites, there were four focus group discussions and all were uh, COC users. Next slide, please. So with regards to potential advantages or benefits of the DPP, uh, the woman felt that the DPP would empower adolescent girls and young women in preventing HIV and pre pregnancy overall and will also contribute to the prevention of school dropouts, uh, especially in adolescent girls, and also uh, protect against starving and also provide protection during spontaneous sexual activity where condom uh, access may be limited. They also felt that to allow women to access HIV and pregnancy prevention options that they can control themselves that will not re rely on a male's input on the decision to use. And will also result in fewer clinic visits for women currently using both PrEP and COCs. And overall, they felt it would lessen the burden of having to take two pills. Next slide, please. With regards to potential challenges for GBP use, we had some product related challenges. Uh, these involved uh, side effects, especially depression, kidney problems, dark spots on the skin and weight loss, which some women saw as a way that would uh, result in them being stigmatized as being HIV positive. And then there was also, an, uh, there was also a need for partner approval noted in married women, along with daily administration of GPP, which, will, which could result in, in inconsistent use or pill fatigue, especially amongst months current COC users. And then there's also a general forgetfulness to use. This was also uh, seen as, uh, as having, to, as something that will take place in both COC and non-COC users. So with regards to the social challenges, so partners and family members who currently are unsupportive of PrEP and COC use may be uh, also against the use of DPP, along with judgmental service providers, and also social cultural norms and taboos regarding adolescent sexual behavior could also come into play as social challenges. And along with community misconceptions and stigma, specifically the belief that this, the use of COCs could lead to, could lead to infertility or that uh, PrEP users are promiscuous. And also low socioeconomic status or ability to afford DPP was seen as another uh, potential challenge should there be a price um, related to uh, DPP. 
And this was also noted along with religious beliefs. Next slide, please. So overall, uh, what you can take away from this is that uh, GDP could offer many benefits to women, um, but its introduction, eff uh, um, introduction efforts will need to consider the, uh, the persistent challenges with service provision and social barriers to contraceptive and HIV service use. So overall, both healthcare providers and women felt GPP will be beneficial and convenient for women. Uh, pill size, uh, daily dosing and side effects may were seen as some things that could affect product adherence, and also that healthcare providers need clear and specific counseling uh, guidance. Uh, for example, there were questions around uh, what to do um, if um, a, a patient, for instance, misses uh, a dose. And then also healthcare providers and women um, want to provision outside the, the facility. So they stated that, for instance, um, mobile clinics along with pharmacies could be more convenient for other women. And also social cultural norms and taboos about both uh, COCs and PrEP may accept uh, acceptability and uptake. And also marital st status may have influence on autonomy in decision making. Judgmental attitude of healthcare providers may influence product uptake for adolescent girls and young women. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, Oh, okay. So we end our, our presentation with this framework, uh, which was recently published by our colleagues at the Population Council, and which has guided our formative research and is informing the clinical trials um, that we are planning. So our work points to the continued need um, to take into account user, uh, provider, and product-centered factors, which interact to influence user acceptability, intention to use, and ultimately uh, product use. So the social and, and structural context of product provision can have an outsized influence on informed choice, product uptake and effectiveness and sustained use. So this we can take into account, uh, for example, neg negative uh, provider attitudes, unsupportive partners, and in some instances, lack of youth friendly uh, uh, services. So our current findings affirm um, the development of a new uh, technology in and itself uh, does not um, imply demand or access or, or actual use of the product, but um, it creates an opportunity uh, for options in uh, prevention options for women, uh, which um, uh, from uh, current research shows that they desperately need. Next slide, please, Adelaide. So I'd like to acknowledge our study participants and our sponsors and all the hardworking teams from both our sides. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adelaide and Sianda, for sharing the uh, early findings from the acceptability studies. And certainly those findings will feed into uh, introduction planning. Our next presenter is Danny Rezar, who will be discussing planning for investment, considerations for modeling cost effects effectiveness for the dual prevention pill. Great, thank you so much. Um, hello, good afternoon and good evening. And thank you to SIF and AVAC for facilitating this satellite. I am honored to be presenting among these thought provoking presentations and panelists. As Jessica noted, my name is Danny Risar and I work in HIV prevention at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. And today I'm very excited to be discussing considerations for modeling the cost effectiveness for the dual prevention pill in order to plan for future investments. And we'll be looking closely at modeling methodology in order to inform future modeling in this space. And I have no conflicts to disclose. So first to provide some background, cost effectiveness modeling has been identified as a critical activity in the overall phased introduction strategy for the DPP which we heard about in Jessica's introduction presentation. And we know that modeling will be really critical for considering financial trade-offs and health benefits of the DPP. So shown here to inform overall product adoption decision-making, rollout approach, and then from there, where to target interventions to increase cost effectiveness and optimize scale-up. So while this kind of modeling will give us an understanding of how cost effectiveness varies across different populations, scenarios, and product use, again, it does not replace the end user qualitative research to understand the priority populations 
which we just heard some of the preliminary findings on. So the objective of this work is to develop a framework to inform robust models that estimate the health outcomes and costs of the DPP over time. And this phased approach and initial methodology framework reflects the need for novel methodologies for MPTs and the need to ensure that future modeling is well aligned with evidence needs of key decision makers in both family planning and HIV. So to recap some of the literature on both HIV prevention and family planning, um, starting here on the left with oral PrEP, we know that oral PrEP is not the most cost-effective prevention option and models comparing it to PMTCT, VMMC, or treatment as prevention, which is not to say that it is not a high value intervention. And cost-effectiveness estimates are wide ranging across different contexts, scenarios, and target populations with improved cost-effectiveness when the most at-risk populations are targeted. And then moving to the third bullet here, of course, effectiveness is a major determinant of cost effectiveness. So in the case of PrEP as a daily product that relies on use, adherence is a really critical lever. And then on the oral contraceptive side on the right, we know that reducing unmet need for family planning is generally highly cost effective anytime it is studied. Um, but when looking at different methods, OCPs do tend to be dominated by long-acting reversible contraceptives and have lower estimated efficacy and effectiveness. And then finally, literature on continuation and adherence is pretty limited for OCPs as the family planning field more often looks directly at couple year protection. But we do see some estimated higher continuation. And then further research suggests that end users may see pregnancy prevention as higher priority than HIV prevention, informing the hypothesis that the DPP may have improved adherence compared to oral PrEP. And thus adherence will be a really important focus in future modeling. So as a dual product, we're going to need an approach that bridges methodologies on both the HIV and family planning sides. And noting that given this existing evidence, while oral PrEP and oral contraceptives may not be the most cost-effective options individually, as a dual product, it will be critical to look at cost-effectiveness across the joint outcomes. And then another important consideration for thinking about the value of the DPP is that there may be benefits in coverage from expanding available methods, as we have seen in the family planning space. So now I want to bring us to the first major area to inform how we plan and design modeling, which are the prioritized research questions. So based on initial consultations, we have identified a few high priority research questions that we see modeling answering. So first, we'll want to understand how DPP compares to oral PrEP, and that is including PrEP alone and the separate use of oral PrEP and OCPs. Uh, we will also want to understand how the cost effectiveness compares to use of oral PrEP with other contraceptive methods. So including injectables and long acting reversible contraceptives. And then C, we'll want to understand how different scenarios for DPP implementation. So by subpopulation, geography, varying levels of contraceptive coverage and method mix affect DPP cost effectiveness. And then finally, we'll also want to understand how the cost effectiveness of the DPP changes under different assumptions of scale up of ART and VMMC, as well as background HIV prevalence rates. Then I also want to highlight a recommendation for future modeling here. So as more information becomes available on other HIV prevention products, and as these potentially become included in standard of care, we will want to compare these options to the DPP. So thinking about the depivirine vaginal ring and long-acting injectable cabotegravir as two near-term options. So given the research questions we have, the next step is considering approach for measuring outcomes, costs, and cost effectiveness, leveraging standards or best practices from family planning and HIV. So starting on the left, in terms of defining effectiveness, we will be looking at HIV infections averted as well as unintended pregnancies averted, the most common outcome measure in family planning. And then we will also have a utility adjusted life year metric to look at combined HIV and family planning outcomes. And then to the right on the cost side, we will be looking at the standard of care costs and the incremental DPP costs. 
to then arrive at our cost to outcome ratios, which we've outlined at the bottom across the various outcomes noted above. So following on from research questions and overall approach, we will also want to understand if different assumptions impact cost effectiveness analysis findings. So we'll want to align on the most relevant settings. So first, based on HIV burden, program landscape and contraceptive method mix, three countries have been identified as likely priorities for modeling and early evidence generation, as we heard from Jessica earlier. And again, these are Kenya, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. And importantly, for modeling purposes, these enable a comparison across contexts with varying contraceptive method mixes. So with OCPs making up a majority of the method mix in Zimbabwe to smaller proportions in both South Africa and Kenya at less than 15%. And then additionally, coverage of various existing prevention interventions will be important to consider. So thinking here about various levels of VMMC coverage, condom use, and ART scale-up. And then third, also related to this bucket of existing risk factors for HIV, we will want to vary HIV prevalence and viral suppression rates. And then moving on from these more context-related variations, we'll also want to understand how product use, costs, and focal populations impact cost effectiveness. So starting from the top, as noted earlier, we know that adherence will be a critical lever for cost effectiveness. So it will be important to understand minimum thresholds required to achieve cost effectiveness in various contexts. We also know that the actual per person per year costs may vary according to product use, and this is particularly related to missed pills and guidance on handling missed pills, which is to throw away the pack and start a new one for certain scenarios with OCPs. And then finally, different focal populations should be considered, both thinking about broad versus narrow rollout approach, as well as different levels of subnational geographic prioritization and different target populations stratified by age group. So finally, to conclude, as we think about cost effectiveness modeling, we also want to take the opportunity to consider other costing related evidence gaps that will remain after initial modeling. So two considerations we have included here are first, it will be important to understand costs from the user's perspective, especially if we're thinking that the DPP may present for some women more facility visits than our current regimen. And then depending on the cadres that provide the DPP, it may be important to consider impact on human resource and utilization with micro-costing, time and motion analyses, or task-oriented mapping with interviews to understand the actual delivery costs and determine efficiencies to reduce costs. And importantly here, we note that additional costing activities will vary by country, so it will be critical to ensure that additional studies are linked to country-specific rollout strategies and health system capacity. So including in particular different delivery channels that are prioritized. So in sum, moving forward at the country level, depending on the landscape, different additional studies or variations may be needed. Thank you to SIF for supporting this work. Thank you so much to all of the speakers for these really interesting presentations that I think have, have hopefully whetted the audience's appetite and, and understanding of both the opportunities that a product like the dual pill brings but also the, the many complexities and, and challenges that go with it. Uh, so to continue the discussion, we have a really exciting panel for you that includes our product developers, representatives from government, policymakers, and more civil society to, to delve into some of these issues a little bit further. Um, and I, we see that a few of you have started to send in some questions for the panel. So please keep doing so uh, through the chat function that you can see on the screen. We'll start with a couple, a couple questions to introduce the panel to you, and then we'll get over to your questions uh, very soon as well. So don't be shy, ask away. Uh, many of your questions will, will help all of the people on this call make sure that product introduction is a, is a success as well. So we, we need all of your different perspectives here um, very much. So, and, and Jessica Rodriguez will be, will be back with me to to help facilitate this part of the conversation and any questions you have for the speakers, um, we'll, we'll also come back to those as well. So to kick us off, I'd like to turn to Kellen Thomas, who is the Director of Infectious Disease uh, at the Center of Excellence for Infectious Disease, excuse me, at Beatrice. 
um, who has been very actively involved since the beginning of this program um, in helping bring this product to life. So Kellen, my, my first question for you, this would, would be the very first multi-purpose technology available for contraception and, and HIV prevention uh, since the condom. Can you tell us a little bit about what prompted Beatrice to want to get involved in this product and, and really why the timeline to market is so much quicker than, than other MPTs? Karen, that's a, that's a great first question. Way to start it off. Um, and before I say anything, I, I just want to thank AVAC um, and the team for inviting me to speak on today's panel. I think as is clear from the presentations, we have a lot of meaty questions uh, to, to get through. And so I, I really am doing this as the start of a much larger conversation. Um, so Taryn, to your question. So as the world's largest manufacturer of ARVs by volume, we're constantly thinking about new ways in which we can accelerate access with our products. And I think for years, uh, the global public health community has struggled um, with the uptake of oral PrEP, particularly amongst uh, young girls and women where the rate of incidence is higher, um, I think. It's around 70% plus of, of new infections every year coming from that demographic. And as we've heard in these presentations and throughout the years, um, there are always reports of issues around acceptability, adherence, um, and particularly stigma um, coming uh, from users, partners, spouses, uh, families um, with taking an antiretroviral product. And so given that we also manufacture contraceptives, we started thinking about, well, what could we do differently to try and destigmatize oral prep? And we started thinking, well, what, why don't we combine a contraceptive with an antiretroviral? Could we pitch this as a contraceptive plus product um, rather than something that is an ARV only? And thinking in particular about countries like Zimbabwe, where the rate of oral contraceptive use is, is quite high. I think it's something around 60% plus um, of women taking a modern method are taking an oral product. So um, we took that and ran with it, and um, we discovered that the R&D was indeed feasible, and then took the opportunity to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, SIF, as you well know, um, who graciously um, offered to fund the majority of our R&D and capital costs uh, for this product. And since then, an entire consortium of partners from HIV and family planning are now working together, as is evident you know, from today, um, on the introduction. So that, that's the first part, uh, how, how this all came to be. In terms of just why this product is a little bit different from some of the other MPTs, I mean, so traditionally, you know, these MPT products, they're new chemical entities, uh, they haven't been proven to be safe and effective yet. And as a result of that, they have to go through all of the preclinical and clinical studies to actually show that they are indeed safe and effective. And that takes time, um, it's incredibly expensive. Um, what we are doing is taking two products oral PrEP and an oral contraceptive product, which have already been shown to be safe and effective when taken together. And we are combining them into a single tablet. So likely, like we do for other generic products, um, whether it's antiretrovirals or hormonals, um, we're establishing bioequivalence to the innovator products. And we can typically bring a product in three to four years versus the 10 plus that might be typical with a new chemical entity. And, you know, I, I think this is, this is a really interesting opportunity because I think that, as we've discussed, this could actually, in many ways, inform how future MPTs are scaled. Um, obviously, I want the DPP to succeed on its own merits, but like we all know, just having a product in country is only the first step to actually figuring out how to scale it. You have everything from what is the right channels, how do you get it into guidelines, who is funding it, how do you procure right? A litany of questions. Um, so ultimately, I think through this experience, hopefully we can have some lessons learned um, with the DPP to hopefully at least pave the way to a degree for some of these next generation products. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kellen. Thank you, Kellen. And the next question is for Lorisu. So Lisu, a community advocate from uh, Advocates for the Prevention of HIV in Africa, commonly known as APA. And um, 
Following the ECHO results, which showed high rates of HIV incidence among women who had access to contraception, there was a clarion call for investment in MPTs. And we also know from end user research that women um, prefer products that reduce the risk of unplanned pregnancy and HIV prevention. So what can the DPP uh, add to the existing HIV prevention and contraceptive mix? And what do you think needs to be done to ensure women can access it once approved and available? Evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that question, for those questions. Um, first of all, I think what is beautiful about this um, DPP is that it tackles quite a couple of um, things that women have been having difficulties with. Number one, we all know that HIV, and the number one HIV um, um, rate cause is poverty. And so by you having a contraception and an HIV method in one, eliminates the trouble that women in the high risk areas, communities where we work in, them having to travel from one clinic to another to get one prevention method and get another one at, at, at another um, um, clinic. That's the problem they're currently having right now. Um, so that it totally eliminates that trans transportation money, um, what, being worried about that as well. Um, it also eliminates the burden of yet another method being put into our bodies because we're constantly taking in things. And a lot of adolescent girls and young women, they forget their contraception, contraceptions, they forget their HIV preps. So um, having one pull with both really does um, eliminate that as well. Um, the personal control that we have, you know, in taking this method as well. Um, and also it eliminates the factors of gender-based violence because we no longer have to um, request consent for in some, in some relationships where some women have to um, ask for consent if they can actually go on contraception or if they can actually take a, a, a PrEP to prevent themselves from, from getting HIV. So it eliminates us also having control of having a choice with what we use for our own bodies, which is really good. So I think with the DPP, we're moving in the right direction in terms of women having better methods and, and, and options when it comes to prevention methods. Um, and I think, uh, above all, the two-in-one prevention method is a sign, yes, absolutely, that we are doing um, great work in the HIV prevention um, space, especially where we're prioritizing women when it comes to the, 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 the contraception and uh, pre HIV prevention. I think I remember in the 2019 um, Durban AIDS conference when we when we introduced the ring and I said, I wish you could get a ring where it, it prevents HIV, pregnancy, STIs, literally everything. So we can let, literally have like one method. So with this, it means that we're moving in the right direction. Um, I think another thing is that for your second question, um, we advocate and engage in communities to equip women with relevant information so that when these um, are declared available in our country, they too can advocate for themselves at healthcare facilities. I think Natasha also mentioned how we do have a crisis where healthcare workers, you know, um, they make choices for what for adolescent girls and women who come through um, 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 the the healthcare facilities for assistance. So once we inform them about this information and these methods, they are able to go in there and further advocate for themselves with the knowing the relevant information on these methods. Um, and sadly, the communities with the highest infection numbers are usually the ones um, with, that are least prioritized in terms of access. Um, we've seen with PrEP in South Africa, where it was approved, but it took forever for it to be available to, um, to where it was actually needed, where the high risk areas are. So I hope that right now with this DPP, our government will actually sh change that and prioritize these key areas um, in our communities. And also, I think, um, anti Sorry, I was about to say anti Yvette. Um, my, my executive director, Yvette, I mentioned in her opening speech that, um, you know, as activists, we constantly have to fight, fight, fight with our governments for these uh, methods to be available. But I think what we need to not forget is that we need to start bringing in, you know, because it goes from the process of it, the results and it being approved, but then we need to start bringing in um, the missing factor of scientists, not only you know, removing themselves from the equation when, when, we, when we get to the point of uh, the approval. But they need to continue and be part of that and be in between the results and approval phase, working together to ensure that there's accessibility after the trials. So um, it's, it shouldn't be only about us feeling like they only want 
to be there when it's the science being done, but also with them being involved there after the trials, it also, I think, puts some kind of pressure for our governments to be accountable in ensuring that these are actually available where they are actually needed. So these are some of the things that need to actually change. And also, I'm glad that you mentioned cost. I think the previous speaker mentioned cost. Um, and I'm hoping that in future, with this DPP, um, it will really be one that can be accessible and affordable. Um, for those who are really in need of it to be able to, 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 um, to afford it and be and have access to it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lee. So in that, that second last point, the importance of building these multi-sectoral movements to, to help get these products to the, the last mile and to the women who need them uh, is, is such an important one. Changing directions a little bit, I'd love to go over to Mande Limbu, who is the Director of Global Initiatives at FP2030. And we, we have a question for her, which I think also resonates with a few of the questions in the chat, where you know, some of the concerns that we've, we've heard as we've moved this product through development have been from the SRH, the family planning stakeholders, um, really about how bringing a product like this and bringing two products into one might have an impact on the family planning space. And this is involved would, would adding HIV to a contraceptive actually stigmatize contraceptive use? Um, what'll happen with our, our long push in the family planning sector over multiple years towards getting women on, on longer acting products? So as, as someone representing the FP community, what, what can be done to help alleviate some of these concerns and figure out how to position the dual prevention pill uh, among these stakeholders? Thank you so much, Taryn, for that um, great question. Um, I think this is indeed a valid concern um, that needs to be addressed to uh, ensure buying from the family planning SHR community. As FP 2030, we have not conducted any formal consultation about DPP, but based on just several uh, conversations with um, you know, a few technical experts, fortunately, most of them do not completely uh, share this concern that DPP will stigmatize contraception and somehow affect contraception use. Obviously, there is a concern um, that MPT products like DPP may somewhat uh, may be somewhat stigmatized and, and their use will perhaps imply um, high risk behavior, especially among adolescent girls. Uh, but there's also a perspective that DPP may not necessarily impact uh, desirability of other uh, contraception products. So there's a general sense, as we've heard from um, other speakers, that women and girls, uh, especially those living in high um, HIV prevalence communities, would actually prefer a combined product. So um, I think, as with any new um, health product introduction, the implementation design must take into account um, any negative unintended effects, including this um, idea of uh, stigmatization of family planning, uh, actually, a colleague uh, mentioned to me recently that when HIV emerged in the 80s, there was a similar uh, conversation at that time about condoms and if they were promoted in family planning programs um, that would uh, stigmatize them for, for FP. So I think there are many lessons learned from past uh, product introductions that could uh, mitigate any unintended effects. Um, there, we have key partners like JPIGO and, and many more who I understand have done excellent work on oral prep um, that as a community, we could leverage their learning uh, to prepare for DPP introduction. I, I believe one way to mitigate stigma is to increase, uh, to increase access to integrated HIV sexual reproductive health care. And Natasha spoke about this in her presentation. Of course, this will only be possible if Providers are uh, proper, properly trained uh, before DPP is rolled out, as, as we all know providers play a key role in influencing demand and uptake. We'll also need to ensure that women and girls, um, their voices are heard. And, and I think that um, is clear from the presentation, um, the study that um, was done in Zimbabwe and South Africa, and that, that women are, and girls are also properly uh, counseled to make informed choices in choosing DPP for uh, dual prevention. So overall, I think an integrated approach will be needed at the country level as, as far as service provision, marketing, distribution, financial support for rollout. I know this is um, easier said than done, especially because pro programs have been uh, siloed for a long time. But I believe DPP offers us um, the, the potential and opportunity to integrate um, HIV and SRHR services uh, to meet the diverse um, health needs of women and girls. 
I would also like to point out that I don't think the new product has been uh, socialized enough among the family planning community compared to the um, HIV space. So as FP2030, we plan to use our convening power and platform to bring together key stakeholders. As you all know, we are not an implementing partner, but we could bring together all the key stakeholders to, to really socialize um, DPP, discuss its rollout and ensure buying from the community. Uh, we've already discussed the potential webinar uh, co-hosted with AVAC this fall. So it's gonna be a series of conversations, hope, hopefully, and, and we hope these conversations will present an opportunity for us as a community to kind of dive deep and, and better understand the impact of DPP introduction to family planning programming, address the concerns and determine what um, is needed to, to break down the silos and foster integration of services and, and therefore enhance uh, method choice for women. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mandy, and we're really excited um, uh, to, to collaborate on the webinar series and convenings uh, to really explore the concerns and, and potential opportunities with the family planning community. Um, next, we'll turn to Chris Jones, who's a senior associate from uh, Man Global Health. Um, and, and this next question speaks to some of the questions we've received um, from the audience and highlights sort of uh, the differences in delivery channels um, between oral contraception and, and PrEP. And we know that many women who do use oral contraception access it through pharmacies and other private sector channels. Um, yet the availability of oral PrEP in these same channels um, right now is limited, but it is growing. Um, and what are some key considerations for introducing the DPP in the private sector and ensuring alignment across oral contraceptive and, and oral PrEP delivery channels? Uh, thanks, Jessica. That's a great question. And, and thank you to AVAC and SIF for the invitation to speak today and for the opportunity to work with this great group of colleagues that are presenting. Um, so there are lots of good reasons why we want to expand introduction of the DPP into the private sector to support scaling efforts. And many of them have already been addressed and raised um, throughout the discussion today. Um, existing user patterns and experiences for the DPP priority populations cleanly align with private sector channels. Up to 50% of young women already meet their FP needs through private sector channels. And this makes sense because private providers are perceived as less stigmatizing, as offering higher quality services with more confidentiality to the user and more convenience through longer working hours. And so together, this presents the opportunity to take the DPP to scale by complementing rollout in the public sector with investments in the thousands of private clinics and the pharmacies that are already meeting the needs of women throughout the region. So early efforts to introduce PrEP in the private sector, as you just mentioned, Jessica, will help pave the way for the DPP to allow uh, uh, introduction. So Kenya, for example, is currently supporting a pilot initiative to introduce PrEP into pharmacy settings. The DPP can tuck into and build off these efforts to expand availability into the private sector and leverage those lessons learned as we roll this out. But there's a lot of work to do to prepare for this. Uh, first of all, advocacy is important and is required to encourage policy shifts, including task shifting to enable the lower level cadres of providers that dominate the private sector to support uptake of the DPP eventually. That includes influencing policies that impact the role of private providers in HIV rapid testing, specifically required to initiate the DPP. Uh, policy shifts could also include the use eventually of self-testing by potential users to initiate use in lower level providers like pharmacies, which will be important. Policy shifts are also required to permit lower level providers to dispense to and resupply the DPP and ultimately prescribing behaviors, which could be down the line, but is, is possible as we've seen in Kenya as well. Um, creatinine testing requirements are currently required, at least on paper, in some countries to initiate PrEP. And so it will be important to address that eventually so that lower level providers or different facilities can prescribe uh, the pill eventually. And the private sector is not immune to the provider challenges we've heard discussed today. And so support through training and medical detailing and tools is also required to equip providers with the knowledge, skills, and motivation to improve this and support users need to initiate and continue use. So that includes adaptation of tailored user risks assessments specifically to uh, be included for private providers, especially those lower level providers like pharmacies, 
Training and tools on counseling of side effects will be needed. Referrals and systems to re support referrals to private providers will be a challenge we know as it is already with existing health systems, but will be important for those that um, as they go through testing are tested positive for HIV. Providers also need private space to support counseling and, and testing required for initiation. Um, supply of the DPP to private providers will also present a number of challenges, especially early in product introduction, and that needs to be considered. Um, so leveraging MOH supply chains will be important in early stages. Um, that, that could include linkages to public sector supply chains um, and linking them to private facilities through nearby public clinics or dispensaries or linkages through partner NGOs or social marketing organizations is an opportunity. And in the long term, facilitating supply through existing private channels will be important. Um, financing is also a, be, a big challenge um, and that will need to be considered uh, through creative financing mechanisms. Um, and that includes developing mechanisms to pay providers for services supporting initiation, including testing and counseling, as well as dispensing. And that includes creative strategic purchasing, which could include um, demand side financing or leveraging out of pocket payments with um, demand side financing or access or linkages to third party payer schemes such as health insurance, whether national or private. And linking private providers into ongoing demand generation work will be critical as well, including better coordination efforts, which will also be important. So one thing that we did see in early analysis was the ability to link into existing public-private partnership models. Um, South Africa has some great models that we can build off of and adapt and, and roll out as well as Kenya. And so that will be important considerations as well as we look forward to um, introducing the product in this, in the, in the really the second phase of the product introduction. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. And, and I think in that you highlighted some, some really important pieces around policy and coordination and just the behemoth task ahead of any new product coming to market. And one thing that makes this a little bit trickier is bringing two sets of stakeholders together. Um, so I think our next question is for Hasina Subadar, who is a technical advisor at the Department of Health in South Africa. Um, so of course, uh, Hasina, I have to ask you, as we've been talking about tonight, HIV and family planning has historically been much more siloed than, than we would like it to be. Um, even though we've had more and more policies in, in recent years that are pushing for integrated delivery. Um, and one of the, the reasons we had invested as SIF into this product was the potential of the DPP to be able to help catalyze some of that integration. From, from your perspective from government, I mean, what coordination mechanisms do you see in South Africa or elsewhere that can really be, be leveraged to overcome some of these silos and, and help to help to live up to that potential for a product like this? Thanks, thanks for that, uh, those questions. And I think that, you know, over the last uh, five years that we've been implementing pre-exposure prophylaxis, what became very, very clear to us is that the integration of HIV services, especially HIV prevention services with uh, sexual reproductive health services is absolutely critical because the cohort that we're trying to reach are definitely the cohort that are at potential risk of both um, SRH-related issues, especially unintended pregnancies. And, you know, I just looked at the, the latest statistics on pregnancies amongst under-19s. And just in the last financial year, we had 140,000 uh, uh, young people that fell pregnant, whether it was intended or unintended. And then if you go into looking at the termination of pregnancy figures, you also see similar um, kinds of high numbers. And, and, and definitely we saw a, a rapid increase in unintended pregnancies, especially during um, the COVID period. And uh, you know people just couldn't access services and despite every effort to try and make sure we reach them. So, so most important in trying to to look at how do we deliver these services in an in a integrated way, in a way that's less siloed and making sure that it is linked to the primary healthcare platform that we provide these services. And, you know, I think what's critical when we're looking at uh, promoting a new product, especially in South Africa, 
we and 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 we do have limited resources, and I think that's something we need to look at and say how do we how do we try and leverage across these two streams of funding that we have, and 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 most of our SRH services is funded through the equitable share, and and the HIV services is funded through the conditional grant. So you you actually got two streams, and then to add to that process, we also have. Um, the donor community uh, bringing in, you know, either funding specifically for HIV prevention, which adds to the complexity of it. And, and, and what has been become very, very clear as we have scaled up uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis in our public clinics is that it has to be delivered as a single package. Uh, HIV prevention, SRH services, and all other services that our target audience require uh, need to be delivered. And, and most important is to also make sure that if, if we're bringing in a new product, we need to demonstrate that these two products that we're bringing in will provide the maximum benefit. So, you know, what is the intention to actually reduce HIV infections and to reduce unintended pregnancies? And we really need to demonstrate that by combining these two products, it is going to give us a good yield and providing it in a way where we actually can demonstrate what that investment uh, is going to yield for the country as well as for the individual. So it's, it's really important that we look at both sides of it. I think the other important aspect is to actually make sure that, you know, if we are going to be combining these two and if we're looking at service integration and providing services, we have to look at service integration, not just uh, as an, as, uh, from a service point of view, but putting the person who is receiving the service at the center of it and to look at what exactly does that individual require and how do we tailor our services around that. And during, during this um, last year, we've spent quite a lot of time looking at uh, using technology. And, 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 and we've, we've had a... a, a um, platform that we've been using to access and reach young people. Um, uh, and, and, and one of the things that we've done is to actually tailor that technology to look at integrating all components of services. So not just health services, but education services, as well as um, uh, uh, you know, support services, psychosocial support, and then SRH and HIV prevention services integrated into that process and creating agency in people to identify what they require. So, so I think that you know, those are some of the critical elements. Uh, the other important element that I, I think that we need to also just make sure is that when we're looking at integrating services, we look at how do we provide integrated packages of services at every service point. And this is across the, the, the spectrum, be it public, private, as well as we are implementing partners provide services through donor um, uh, support. I'm, I'm going to stop here and, 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 and perhaps maybe pick up a few other things um, a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hasina, for highlighting um, some of the complexities from a funding perspective, as well as the importance of um, delivering a combined product like the DPP in fully integrated services. I, I think that's are really critical. And we have so many fantastic questions from uh, the audience. So I think we'll move to answer a few of them with the time that we have remaining. Um, the first, which we've touched on a, a bit, are the reasons for low uptake of PrEP are likely to affect the uptake of the DPP. How do you hope to mitigate for this? Um, and perhaps, Kellen, you can take that one from a product perspective. Um, and maybe Adlite or Sayanda, you can take it from uh, the perspective of some of your, the findings that you presented. Sure, sure. Thanks, Jessica. I mean, from, from a product perspective, we realize that this product needs to be truly differentiated from oral prep as it is today. Uh, so we're taking, I think, some pretty concrete steps to, you know, emphasize the differentiation as much as possible. Uh, this product Will not be in a bottle. Uh, it will be in a wallet compliance pack, similar to what you see with oral contraceptives. You'll have pink peach colored tablets, not the traditional colors associated, you know, with ARVs. 
And there will hopefully be more wellness lifestyle branding um, associated with the packaging than the, the typical very medicalized packaging that you would see with an, an A or B. And what we are doing, um, at least in partnership with AVAC and others, is working in the country level, specifically South Africa and Zimbabwe, to conduct user research on what the presentation should be like. So, you know, we're not making these decisions in isolation on the product um, and making sure that it's as data driven as possible. And our hope, and we know it's not, we know it's not a perfect solution. The product is not everything, but we hope um, that by creating enough of a differentiation with oral prep and by pitching it as, as this contraceptive plus option, that we can at least alleviate some of the stigma issues um, and acceptability issues that we've seen so commonly with World Prep. And Adelaide or Siyanda, are you still with us? Would you like to take that? Oh, question? thank you. Oh, sure. Could you please just repeat the question for me? I had a little break in my connection. Sure. So uh, there's concern that there's been low uptake with uh, oral prep and that uh, the same could be the case for the DPP and how would we mitigate this? So based on the early findings from the acceptability study, um, what would you say to that? Uh, so, uh, yes. So with um, when it comes to prep, uh, so one thing that we have generally noticed is that there could be an issue with the way it had been introduced originally. So initially it was introduced to key populations, be it the MSM population or women who are involved in sex work. So that could have been our missed opportunity in a sense when it comes to, with regards to women in general, just the general woman population. So this I feel presents another opportunity for us to introduce PrEP as something that women can own and that they can then use at their discretion, as they say, you know, in, in our interviews. Um, so, and also just to bring another perspective in, um, so this did also come up with some of our questions and we found that uh, women generally feel that without a differentiation between the two, it will actually make it easier to take um, products such as PrEP as there's no more, um, this is for uh, people who are presumed pr promiscuous, if I can put it like that, but this is a product that any woman can take that prevents both HIV and unintended pregnancy. I hope that answers my question. That answers the question, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Jones, uh, for responding to part of the question. So uh, from uh, the healthcare uh, provider perspective, uh, they pointed out that uh, in our context, the PrEP was not uh, properly introduced. It was not uh, really marketed well, and uh, the target uh, population from what uh, the people view, they view it as uh, it is intended for use by commercial sex workers. So I think uh, if uh, we revisit how we are going to market the DPP, I think that will go a long way in uh, increasing its uptake and acceptability. And also on the issue of uh, differentiation, the adolescent girls and young women expressed concern that uh, these are uh, the DPP would need to be different from PrEP so that uh, that stigma that usually comes uh, with PrEP is also not uh, going to be experienced uh, with their use of uh, DPP. So that's uh, what we got uh, from the findings that we have so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I think this next question, uh, I'll combine a couple together um, and perhaps for both Natasha and for, and for Hasina. Um, Natasha, I think you, you started a lot of discussion at the very beginning when you were talking about the importance of really training and users on what these products are. And that I think the theme came out several times after that in questions about the importance of training healthcare workers to guide women through shared decision-making. So I wonder if both Natasha first and, and then Hasina, you can comment on what is it that we need to do to really equip healthcare providers to deal with the world of complex products that have multiple indications or even just having multiple types of, of products in the market now? How do we equip those healthcare providers? 
Thank you so much for your question. Well, it, there are many approaches to this. First of all, a healthcare provider will, I'm a healthcare provider myself. Um, so I do understand how this works to some extent. So what happens is that a healthcare provider cannot speak confidently about a product that they don't have enough information about. While it is important that healthcare providers provide, I mean, well, make an effort to develop themselves and get more information about products like Googling or searching. There's also a need for them to understand why the product is important for this sector now. Uh, because when it comes to PrEP and uh, contraception, there are also some social and cultural norms that affect people's perception of some of these products. So it's also important to think about value clarification uh, and value clarification is very important for healthcare providers to understand that they need to advise their clients, not based on what they would do, but based on what's available and understand that it's their choice. And this is something that needs to continuously happen. Uh, it's also important for healthcare providers to know this because there are so many products coming up on the market. So it's very easy for them to lose track, especially if, for example, they are working on in HIV or working on in family planning. Um, there's sometimes loss of information somewhere along the way because of the way the sectors are arranged. So that's a reason why it's important for us to think about um, building their capacity on these new products. And this has to be continuous from both a pre-service perspective as well as an in-service perspective, which is why I spoke about adding these some of these new products to curriculums. Uh, can I come in here? And I think it is, you know, if, if we look at healthcare workers, they really are in terms of promoting a particular product or, or, or convincing a healthcare user to use a product, they have to be champions. And, and I think that that is always such a difficult challenge. You know, uh, if, if they're not convinced that it works, uh, if they're not unsure about it. And unfortunately, we invest very little in healthcare providers uh, as champions and, and, and supporting them to become champions of a particular product. And, you know, one of the things that we need to possibly look at is to say, you know, do we rely solely on healthcare workers or do we actually have complementary tools that empower people to be able to make that choice and not rely solely on a healthcare provider to offer it to them or to convince them to take it? And this is where I think one of the, the, the you know, I, I alluded to it earlier around the issue of using um, uh, technology, using mobile apps, using uh, 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 tools that can assist people to make these choices, to provide them with the necessary information so that when they actually land up at a healthcare facility, they know exactly what they want and ask for it. And, and the healthcare provider will just support them to be able to access it. So I think we need to think about offering this product maybe slightly differently to say that the push should come from the healthcare user, not from the healthcare uh, provider only. So we need to you know, work on both elements. And I think that you know, we talk quite a lot about social mobilization and most times our social mobilization is very much around just providing the information. It stops short at helping people making that choice. So you know, I think that one of the things that we need to do in introducing this is a particular product is to say, how do we complement it with tools that will enable people to utilize this? Thank you. Thank you so much, Hasina. And um, I'll ask, I think the last question of the, the session as we um, try to wrap up, but uh, we know that uh, long acting contraceptive use is um, increasing in uh, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, which means that oral contraceptive use is uh, on the decline. Um, and given the increase in access to long-acting contraception, um, how will this been taken into account as D DPP work moves forward? Uh, so perhaps uh, Loiso and, and Mandy, you can uh, respond uh, briefly to, to this really important question. Sorry, can you repeat that question quickly? Um, just sorry about that. Uh, sure. Uh, 
So uh, long-acting contraception is on the increase in most of sub-Saharan Africa, um, and oral contraceptive use has been on the decline. And so given that context, um, how will this be taken into account as the DPP work moves forward? Thanks, Jessica. I think I, think I can start. I think that's actually, um, it's very true. Um, and I, I think it will require new messaging and, and for users regarding the uh, dual benefits of DPP to increase acceptability, uh, because I think there's already a shift to injectables and, and implants because they're, um, you know, more effective methods. I was actually interested to know if that came up at all um, in the studies and the um, interviews with women in South Africa and, and Zimbabwe and, and how that was taken into, into account. So I, I don't necessarily have a, 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 an answer in terms of how that should be taken into account um, as, as BPP moves forward, but it is, uh, you know, it's, 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 it is the kind of current landscape and, and trend as far as um, uh, access to, you know, oral con contraceptives and, and the, the decline in Sub-Saharan Africa. I absolutely agree with um, Mande. She's totally nailed it. And I think also what um, um, Hadisa said recently, um, just now, is that we also need to look at different ways of promoting this, this prevention method as well. Um, and by learning, you know, from what has happened with the previous ones, the oral ones and so forth. So I think, um, yeah, I'm in total agreement with Mande. And I would just... I would just like to add to that. Um, I think uh, as we started off uh, the session, um, it is really clear that initially, you know, the, the PPP will not be marketed uh, to women who are already on long acting uh, contraception. It will be really for women who are on um, oral contraception or PrEP um, or who are um, not using either. Um, so that would be uh, women who would be uh, targeted um, and, and considered for, for DPP use. Uh, the, the other thing that I would uh, want to say, um, so we do not want to draw women away from more efficacious um, family planning methods at all. And there, this relates to another question, which is, you know, is there consideration for combining long acting uh, COCs and long acting PrEP drugs anytime soon? And I think um, as we shared in the beginning of the session as well, that those um, those formulations and MPTs are in early stages of development, so they likely will not be available for many, many years to come. While uh, the time to market, because the DPP can um, bypass a large uh, long clinical trial and instead rely on uh, bioequivalent studies, uh, likely will be available sooner. And so that is one of the reasons why it may um, generate many lessons learned for other long-acting um, MPTs that could possibly be available in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, so first of all, a huge thank you to all of the speakers and panelists who some are up very late this evening sharing really terrific insights for, for all of us about the potential and the complexities of bringing a multi-indication product like this dual prevention pill to market. And as Jessica just said, uh, really paving the way and helping us learn what all of the many complexities and challenges are to overcome when we start to bring products together. And I think that's what's most interesting about this, this product is it's both interesting in its own right, but also can be this first test case for where, where we really hope we're going to be in 10 years down the line in product development is bringing dual injectables and dual implants to, to market that will be extremely beneficial for, for, for many different users as well. Um, and just to quickly sum up, we heard a really interesting diversity of user and provider perspectives that I think we're, we're quite honest and frank about both where there's some really exciting opportunities, but also many of the, the barriers and the interesting work that's going to need to happen to figure out how to bring a product like this to market how to break through some of the, the systemic challenges that have built up over the years as HIV and family planning have, have, have operated often in their silos. And I think some of what I found most exciting is the excitement from the providers that has come out of the Population Council research and the recognition that products like this could really make a, a huge difference in 
in the lives of their clients. And I think building on that to really help providers become champions, as Hasina was saying, um, but also to make sure that we're putting the tools in the hands of users to figure out if this product is the right one for them, given, given their particular situation, or and if not, whether the, the ring is the right product for them or, or what contraceptive is as well. So there's a long journey of figuring out where this product is going to fit and who it's going to best serve. But it's clear that there is a group of women who are very excited about this idea of, of having a product that can help them deal with some of the challenging stigma and gender norms that are, that are issues for them. Um, but I think also recognizing that there's still many barriers to contraception uh, that affect a product like this as well. So whether we look at this as contraceptive plus HIV or whether you look at it as HIV plus contraceptives, there's, there's still a lot of underlying work that a product like this will benefit from as we're also bringing the ring and other new contraceptives or new HIV prevention products to market. Um, and I think it was particularly interesting to also hear Danny's presentation as well about how do we start to weigh some of these decisions about whether a dual product has the right level of impact. And I think we, we heard a little bit of that from Hasina as well about how a government's going to think about uh, whether a product like this fits into their product mix or, or not. So thank you to everyone for, for joining for this last hour and a half. Hopefully it's been a really interesting discussion for all of you in Food for Thought. And hopefully over the next few years, as this product gets closer to market and then, and then launches, you'll all be part of the, the movement of helping us figure out how we do get this product right into the right to the doorsteps of, of the women who, who, want to, who want to use a product like this so it can have the impact that they want on their lives. So thank you so much and good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Thank you.